You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for a special edition episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, I do things on my time. Let me just be clear about that. Um, you know, all this, you're going to do a special edition episode, blah, 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 blah. Listen, you know, you got to let things happen. You know, you just don't jump the gun. You know, anything could have happened. Um, and, you know, there's just some stuff that I have just really tried to ignore and often I do a good job most of the time and then flare ups happen and here we are. Um, that's how I feel about Justin Timberlake. Like I really would like not like to talk about that guy uh, unless there was a check involved or, uh, you know, something of, of necessity, honestly. I don't really care what this man really do anymore um, unless, you know, he decides to do another song. And then, I, then, then, of course, yeah, I guess I have to comment. But I wonder how, like, people like Monica Lewinsky feel like, you know, like it's been, what, 25 years that people still be talking about, you know, how, you know, former President Bill Clinton abused his power and she had her situation with him. Right. Like, I wonder how she feels. Like, every time something happens, there's almost like this sense that she has to speak on it. And in many ways, speaking about whatever your situation is, is only your power and reclaiming it. And so that's how I think about it at certain times. But then sometimes I just don't care. But <laughs> shit happens. And because it's not too far away, you know, you know, sometimes you have to speak on some things. And so... In this case, that situation is NABJ. Um, you know, I told you so. I, I'll start there. You know, I, I told y'all so. I, I told people this. Um, I mean, you all know the headline of this podcast, this special edition episode. So, you know what we're talking about and what we're going to get into. And I told myself, I gave myself a little dare. I said, I was not going to do a special edition episode unless I was close to 40,000 followers on Twitter. I am less than 100. By the time this is heard, I might even get to 40,000. But I literally told myself if I was close to 40,000 or get to 40, like basically at 40,000 followers, I'll I'll do it. Because I was about 38,000 early this week. And... Over the past several days, there's been a rapid increase in folks following me for various reasons. You know, we'll talk more about that in the episode that I'll be doing later this week. That is, you know, the the fourth episode. I believe we're in episode four now, season season seven. So I'll talk about that then. Um, but for now, it's 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 yeah, it's it's a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to focus on this episode because I didn't want my next episode of this season to be focused on this. There might be some updates, but I just know that this is its own situation and I want to just address this here. Um, and then kind of just move on unless there is something ridiculously outlandishly crazy like a major resignation or something maybe but you know customer service even though y'all not really customers because y'all don't pay for this episode but you all are loyal subscribers and listeners and so many of you all have been subscribing shout out to all the, the new listeners and subscribers my goodness the the level of people who have followed me and have bought this book over the past couple of days i mean it's just it's been nuts i must say i am i am i am literally you know, answering to supply and demand. Like the way in which this podcast has skyrocketed in subscribers and listeners in the past week has been crazy, like crazy. 
Um, so I'm just responding to uh, supplier demand. <laughs> you know, uh, but, you know, the people want it, but also managing my self care because a lot of this I wouldn't say is triggering, but it can be uncomfortable sometimes. I have to revisit dark moments in one's life. Um, uncomfortable moments in one's life. And while people got to remember, I'm a person. So I do things at the level of my comfort. You know, I'm not a career horse. I don't believe in that. I know there's people that that just do stuff just because everybody. No, no, no. I, I'm very big on telling people boundaries, boundaries, because you want to set boundaries. And that's important. Some people have worked themselves to death in industries or stressed themselves out. Let me be clear. No one's going to stress me out. I, I just put pause on something. I just separate from it. You know, if I, if I can, and 90% of the time I can, sometimes I'm in the middle of work. So, you know, it's just, ha it's, it's haphazard. Right. But I'm very fortunate to be in a position in my life and my career where as an independent journalist that work with media companies, not for, because there's a difference. I'm able to, to take time to separate, separate from the bullshit. Um, but to a lot of my colleagues in this industry, especially black journalists, they don't have that luxury, you know, because sometimes places and spaces that they thought they that was a safe space for them becomes more labor, more work, more triggering, more trauma, more more PTSD. It's just it's toxic. And um, I got to say that because I'm going to break it down, but I just want to lay the I want to lay the foundation here with this episode in particular, I want I want to be very clear about my headspace because I know the streets are talking because I'm in the streets talking. So I know the streets are talking, but I want to be very clear about several things. Um, I don't take joy in people's misery. I don't. I want to be clear about that. I don't take joy in people's misery. Um, that's just not who I am. That being said. I do believe in being inaugurated, exonerated. I do believe in that. I do believe in exoneration. I do believe in justice. I do believe in restorative justice. I do believe in atonement. So let me be very clear. What I'm experiencing right now, this week, is so many mixed emotions um, because while I don't respect the leadership of NABJ, and I think a lot of people agree with me now, um, I do care for a lot of the journalists and people there because a lot of those people are good people. They mean well. And even if they didn't necessarily speak up and have my back and, and speak truth to power, I don't wish any ill will on them. But I will say this, and this is what leads me to this. There's a song that Lady Gaga did for a film that was nominated for an Oscar. This is not A Star is Born. It was a great film. Um, it was a documentary about rape culture. Um, and there's a song that she did called Until It Happens to You. And it's a very powerful song. Um, uh, Till It Happens to You is the name of the song. Um, the film, the documentary is called, uh, the hunting ground, which documented campus rape in the United States. It came out in 2015. And this song was written by Diane Warren, who is, as you all know, an iconic film songwriter for films. <laughs> She's got tons of Oscars, never won one, which is blasphemous. Um, but this song, Till It Happens to You, it talks about this logic, this this thought. I mean, it's deep, but until, you know, it, people oftentimes do not understand something until it happens to them. They don't understand the heart, the betrayal, until it happens to them. And it should not, right? Things should not happen to people before they wake up. But in so many ways, until it happens to you, you will understand. And so I don't need to rehash my past with NBJ. It's been documented. It's in the streets. 
Everybody knows. Um, you know, I, I was a part of that organization, the National Association of Black Journalists, for many years. Um, was a volunteer, got a, many awards from them, got an award from them last year, even after I was banned. And I whistleblowed about a lot of the wrongdoing that I saw, a lot of the lack of transparency, a lot of the paternalism, a lot of the elitism, a lot of the transphobia and homophobia that I experienced and seen others in my community experience. A lot of the bullshit, um, the back doors, the lies, the backdoor deals, the manipulation, the exploitation of people on the local level. I spoke about it. I shared it. I whistleblowed it. And I also was trying to be a part of the change. I ran for parliamentarian on the board. I ran for secretary on the board. I ran for treasurer on the board. And I lost all three of those races. They were nasty races. Um, and I lost friends. I lost people I thought were my friend. Um, and I dealt with a lot. Um, my leadership clashed with the National Organization of Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists, as you all know, used to be affiliated with NABJ. Um, because of a lot of the bullshit that was going on in in house and outside of house with that organization, we severed ties in December of 2022. Um, it was it was a big deal at the time. It was very controversial because the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists is the first black journalism association of its kind in America. We were founded in 1974 and ABJ was found in 1975. We predate them. And so when this separation happened, it was a big damn deal. And I knew that there was going to be a price to pay when that decision was made. And I paid the price. Shortly after that, in, in early 2023 in the spring, I was banned for five years from the organization. Um, I was the first member to be publicly and officially banned in some type of way by the National Association of Black Journalists in their entire nearly 50 year history. Myself, a young black freelance journalist, millennial, was the first. To be very clear, they said it was on on, on accusations of me um, publicly disparaging the organization, disinformation, misinformation, the irony, um, and, and, and calling them out in the way in which I did on social media platforms and on my podcast. Um, everything I said could be verified by fact. And anything that I didn't verify by fact, I made clear was my opinion. Um, I didn't get a due process. You know, there wasn't, I didn't get a chance to ever actually speak directly to the board or the committee. Um, there was communication that they did via email, but I had no actual fair, quote unquote, trial or hearing. Um, there was no due process. They did it swiftly. They did not allow me to appeal the decision. They didn't even inform the board that they had of all the details to which they did this. Um, it was very dirty. And the leadership that is currently in place right now was a part of that decision. Um, many of some of those people um, that are new to the new leadership that got installed, a lot of them are incumbents. And there were a couple of new people that got appointed in the process. But even after that, um, after me even being banned in the way in which I, I was, um, NABJ made it officially permanent that PABJ would no longer be affiliated with NABJ, even after we made it clear that we was willing to come to the table and work it out with a new president, which is the current president, NABJ, Ken Lemon. Um, he played with us for several months in a lot of phone conversations that pretty much as you, as some of you all know, led to them behind our backs trying to create another chapter, which they do currently have one that is pretty much a figurehead of a group that there's no real meat. There's no real stances. They, they're just kind of pretty much what I would call NABJ inquirer because they decided to line themselves with Philadelphia inquirer um, to do this. It was very harmful. They tried to break me. They tried to um, silence me. They tried to retaliate against me, intimidate me um, and really blacklist me and blow me out of this, out of this industry. Um, there were several of nasty things that were said about me, a lot of lies, a lot of attempts to, um, really bring me down. And if it was not for the black journalists in Philadelphia 
my friends, my followers, folks who was not in the industry that was there for me during this time. Um, I don't know what could have happened, to be honest. Um, I'm standing in my in this position now in my career because of the fact that I always had faith that the truth will reveal itself. I always had faith in my talents, my abilities, and that if I led with integrity, if I led with transparency, if I led with the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it was, how unpopular it was, it would exonerate me. And so a year ago from this time, NABJ people, folks were in Philadelphia. Them snakes know who they are. I don't got to even name the snakes. But at the convention last year, they got together to find a way, attempt to over to overturn my leadership within my organization. They, they was trying to upsert power. They were plotting in Birmingham, a couple of them, having meetings at houses. I already know everything, all the receipts, okay? And here we are a year from now. Until you do right by me, everything you see. See, I'm calling the color purple. It That's exactly what this feels like. And so... It's been weird this week because so many people who distance themselves from me in the industry, and I'm talking a lot of the big wigs, the national folks that kind of distance themselves from me, um, people who just got quiet and radio silent, disappeared on me, um, ghosted me, you know, they're coming back and they're saying, you was right. And, you know, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. And I'm not even going to be condescending. I'm not going to be shady. You know what I'm saying? There's always a space and place for grace. I accept the apology. We're not homies though, but I accept the apology. And there's a lot of people that's quiet right now for various reasons. Because what NABJ just done was something that I said they was going to do. Something I've been saying that they were about for a long time. And Sometimes you want to be wrong, but when people do you wrong, you want to be right. And I was right. I was right. And the sad part about being right about things that hurt people is that people have to get hurt for you to be able to be the prophecy to which you said something was going to be, be. And that is the bittersweetness of it. Is that while I am exonerated by so many people that now understand what I've been trying to say for several years, the truth of the matter is so much damage and harm has had to happen. What if we just believe people when they say it the first time? What if we just give people the benefit of, what if we just actually look at the facts and get out of our fucking feelings? Because I never said anything without receipts. I always had receipts. The receipts were always there. I've always said everything with receipts, but people didn't care because there's a word that's been used this week. And this word I'm going to use because it's a word right now. And it's called careerism. And careerism is this idea that people believe that advancing their professional standing will, will exonerate them and, and give them levels of experience and respect and dignity and that if they advance their professional work, if they become a workhorse, if they work hard in this way, that everything's going to pay off. And that that's going to to to, you know, exempt them from whatever bullshit that might encounter. It's not true. And for black people specifically, careerism will kill us. It kills us, actually. We think we can work our way through the stress. We think we can work our way through the trauma. We think that we can just be twice as good in whatever we're doing. And then people will respect us. Newsflash. They don't. They won't. They'll just keep exploiting. But there were people who thought, let me distance myself because I got to get what I need to get. And that dog for an eye for an eye, dog eat dogs mentality created a situation where they allowed it. When I got banned, a lot of your favorite black journalists, and I want to call them out, but I'm going to let them live because you know who they are and they know who they are. 
a lot of them, national names, was asked to sign a letter to tell NABJ to rescind that decision, to not do that, to, to that, that banning me and censoring me in this way was not the right way. They said no. They didn't want to be attached to the to it. They didn't want to be associated with me. They didn't want to, you know, look like they were calling out their organization. It was too controversial. It was it was too much to speak out. And, and for somebody who, like myself, would have done it for them because I've always done it for them. I've always spoke up for other black journalists. I've used my position as the president of PABJ, as the VP of print before I was president of PABJ. I have used my platform to defend and, 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 and demand change because I had the ability and freedom to do so. But when it was my time, they did not do it. They saw what was happening. They was texting me privately like they are now, but publicly was silent. And so here we are now. And these same people are now publicly saying resignations and boycotts and divestment. I'm just like, okay. We had to wait for Trump to come to do it, but we could have, we could have did this differently. And so now people has had to get hurt. The city of Chicago, which ironically is my birthplace. A city that I was born. That's, that, that's where I was born. I was just there two weeks ago. A city that I was born. Like in all, just things, just the weirdness of it all. It just, all of these emotions. But for this to happen in a city that I was born and, and, and to see this, these connections, it's all of these things. You just couldn't, you just couldn't make it up. You just couldn't make it up. And the, and the crazy part is about all of this is that at the time when I was the vice president of print for PABJ, a couple years ago, we made a bid PABJ before we left NABJ, before all this severance ties, this was a couple years ago around, I want to say 2008, 2000, no, 2018, 2019, there was bids in place. And we wanted 2024 to be the, the, the convention. We wanted to get the NABJ convention in Philadelphia in 2024 because we wanted to, to it to be a commemoration of our 50th anniversary because this year is our 50th anniversary. And we campaigned. I think the city spent like 60 to 70 thousand dollars on a bid to try to get it we 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 sent people out here hope put people in hotels flew people out we we wind and dine folks we campaigned with this board heavily to get the national convention in philly because philly is a convention city and instead of them doing that they basically gave us their ass to kiss and told us that this that our city didn't want it hard enough, that we we didn't go hard enough, and and all these excuses. But the truth of the matter was, the president of NABJ at the time, or what was Sarah Glover from Philly, um, there was some some drama, and she's from Philly, but she always there was a there was some a rift between PABJ and her at the time, leadership wise. You know, we <laughs> I'm not trying to go down a rabbit hole and pull out receipts, but there was a party through for her. PABJ had to coordinate and, and, and do a party for her. She was finishing her two-year term. This is my former mentor, so I'm not saying anything that I wouldn't say to her directly. We don't talk anymore. She's one of the people that definitely backstabbed me. I I, I have no problem saying that. She did. Um, wasn't trying to name names, but for history's sake, it just needs to be stated. We're, we're, we're not, we don't talk to each other, and it's it's heartbreaking because she was a mentor of mine for 10 years and a lot of just dirty politics. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. But we didn't get it. And Dorothy Tucker, who was the president of NABJ, the one who led the charge and, and, and basically stabbed the final net, you know, knife in my back to get me banned, um, right before she exited her presidency, um, she wanted Chicago. Chicago finally got picked under her leadership, if I'm not mistaken. And she's from Chicago. 
as well. And I believe, and I, what I've heard, and I can't confirm it, but I do remember there was whispers that there was no formal RFP process for Chicago. Like Chicago kind of got rushed in. Um, and it wasn't the same level of proposal, engagement, RFP, the same way that Philly did. But Chicago got picked. Um, so there's a lot that can be said about that. But when it happened, it was very devastating at the time for Philly because we really, really wanted to have that convention here. Um, but be careful what you ask for because sometimes you might not get it and you shouldn't get it and you'll find out. So, you know, there's a lot of history here before we get to the shit show that it was. Now, here we are, fast forward to 2024. Chicago is the convention. There's a chapter. There's people that worked hard to really put this down on a local level. Um, and days before, two days, Monday, before, you know, everybody knew there's this late night drop that's, oh, by the way, Trump's coming on Wednesday. And you could just see, you could feel the floor shake immediately. That even from a crisis communication standpoint, as somebody who's got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree in communication, you know, communication management, USC Annenberg, School of Communication and Journalism. I got a master's degree in this. I'm a journalist by trade, but I was professionally educated in, as a scholar in communications. Anytime somebody drops a press release or announcement late at night or on a Friday evening or afternoon or whatever, that is them trying to beat the news. Like they're trying to, they're trying to bury it in a way where they're trying to beat the, the, the chaos, right? And so that's what they did. It was a late night drop, like a, by the way, and, and all hell broke loose that night. The internet has been exploding. Black Twitter, black journalism, Twitter, me, the media community. It's been a, it's been crazy. And so many questions were just not answered in a timely fashion. And more and more and more comes out. We find out that, you know, Vice President Kamala Harris, who is on a big tour, you know, she's traveling. She had her, you know, rally in Atlanta, Georgia on Tuesday with Quavo and Meg Thee Stallion. She is going to Sheila Jackson, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee's funeral on Thursday. Her schedule was packed. She was just Wednesday. She was doing, you know, a speech for Sigma um, Gamma Rho, SG Rho um, in Houston, Texas. She's on the road. She offered to do a virtual. They said no. They didn't want a virtual from her. Because they want to make a power play. Because they thought they were so important that they needed her to be there because Trump decided to be there. And to be clear, Secret Service does not come a day before. So they knew Trump was coming before Monday. I, I don't believe for five seconds that they found out Monday night when they dropped their press release. They probably knew much longer than Secret Service has to come, confirm. There's no way that Trump just popped up from the sky. They decided to drop that information before anybody could cancel their flights, change their hotels, or do any switches. It was a strategic move by them to lock money in. It is now their largest convention of all time. Currently, over 4,000 people registered has come. And that traction was because of Trump. This was a money play. People keep trying to figure out why, why did they have Trump? Because in one sense, there was the level of, number one, getting attention and energy to this convention in ways that they probably would have achieved a little bit of it without. But of course, everything that's connected with Trump's appearance made this bigger than a membership gathering, but a news clipping. So now all over CNN, all over social media right now, all over the press, we're being told everything that Trump said at this little 35 minute event. And I say that with parentheses, event. But that was a move. That was a power move. That was a power move that came at the detriment of their members because let's be very clear. And I want to make this very clear because everybody's asking this. I've made, I've done interviews on Fox. I've done an interview for News, Newsmax, I believe. Um, a lot of press has been calling me. I spoke to USA Today. Columbia um, Journalism Review reached out to me. 
I've been talking to a lot of media and press, and I want to make it clear here. NABJ is not a news outlet. It is a journalism advocacy organization. It advocates on behalf of black journalists. So when I tell you that choices were made, choices were made. They were not mandated. They did not have to have this format. They did not have to do it in this way. They did not have to invite Trump or Kamala this year. They could have sat it out or they could have respectfully allowed both of them to be able to be present in whatever format and way they could for the sake of transparency, right? So look, if Kamala, if the, if the, let's just entertain the bullshit for a minute, for five seconds, that if, the, if they're using the argument that they are a news, that they are supposed to, you know, be journalists and be objective, which real journalists, any woke, any educated journalist in 2024 that is that is that understands the current climate and understands journalism in a modern era, a contemporary way of understanding it, understands that this term objective is a dated, archaic term that has been historically used to silence and weaponize journalistic integrity against black people from having critical common sense and what they're seeing and reporting on. Wesley Laurie, who's a longtime respected journalist, a fellow millennial black journalist in the field, look up his article in his reporting and talks about this objectivity in journalism and, and wake up people because we don't use the word objective. Anytime I hear, you know, a person's not a journalist or know nothing about journalists in 2024 when they tell people, well, isn't your job to be objective? What the fuck does objective mean? Like, seriously, every human being has is not we're not robots. We come with lived experiences. We come with perspective that shapes our thinking. What's important about journalism is to be fair and to be accurate. Objectivity would have you thinking by the definition of what people use it for that you're supposed to just channel out any thoughts or feelings or emotions. That's not possible. We're human beings. That's, that's, that's like telling police officers to be objective. Clearly they have racial bias. Clearly journalists, Right. White newsrooms have racial bias. If you put if you coverage will never be objectively the same with every single news reporter. If you have an all white newsroom, which most of America do, you will see how they bring themselves into their coverage, which is why diversity, equity, and inclusion needs to exist in newsrooms and in workspaces, because there's no way for any human being, whether they're a journalist or they're a scientist or, or a doctor to be objective. So why do people expect this robotic sense of objectivity, quote unquote, on journalists when we see that it's not possible to do it in any job known to mankind? So objectivity is bullshit. The goal is to be fair and accurate. You can feel how you feel, but tell the truth, share the facts, and make sure you're giving people fairness and opportunity. NABJ did not do that. They were not fair. They were not balanced. The sitting vice president of the United States offered to speak to this organization and they told them no because the person, the, the vice president would not give them an in-person experience. Why does it matter whether she's in person or virtual? If she was going to answer the questions and speak to the membership, give her her platform. And you know what she's doing. She's not dodging black journalists. Clearly, that's not the case. So the fact that they did this was all about trying to curate a moment. And what a moment they got. So everybody talking about, they're focusing so much on being fair to Trump. Like, oh, black journalists got to prove they're impartial to Trump. Black journalists have been anything has been everything, has been fair. Trump has been any, any, everything but impartial to black journalists. He lies, he insults, he berates, he personally attacks black journalists. And how do we know this? Because NABJ has put out statements over the years of him disrespecting black women reporters and political journalists like April Ryan like Yamish Alcindor, like Abby Phillip, and other black women in the field. This is what he's done. 
They've spoken on it. So for them to treat Trump like he's a regular candidate, to normalize him as if they don't know what he's going to particularly do, is just intellectually dishonest. It's reckless. It's selfish. It's, 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 it's disgusting. And it's not ethical. Because if you're going to bring a circus, you got to have parameters. You got to have ground rules. Or better yet, make this man apologize to the organization for lying and disrespecting their organization. He has attacked NABJ members. And you couldn't even get this man to show up and even give a simple apology. You just move past it. So all of this talk about fairness, where was the fairness to the members? Where was the fairness to um, the black reporters that, that has dealt with, dealt with Trump? It was gaslighting an entire crew. It was almost treating them as if you all suddenly forgot. Where was the demand of an apology before having this man sit there? Because remember, you're an advocacy organization. And unless NABJ stopped being an advocacy organization, maybe they're not. But let me let you know what we do at PABJ as the president. You will not come into a space like that. There's a time and place. If NABJ want to do this, do a separate event. They're, they have Kamala. They're, they're claiming now that they've been in talks with Kamala. And that now they're going to schedule a virtual conversation with her, you know, after the convention at a later date. They should have done the same thing with Trump. They should have not brought this man to this convention without giving Kamala equal space. The vice president deserved an opportunity if she couldn't physically come. But in the same week, given what we know, optics wise, there was an opportunity for Kamala to do this virtually this, this week during the convention. And they said no to her. And then turned around and tried to ask for one of her surrogates like Obama, like Oprah, and apparently Meg Thee Stallion? Come on. The reality is, why would you replace an actual sitting vice president running for president of the United States with a surrogate in lieu of the president, the former president, like I'm, I'm trying to understand this. So, so if the I, if the mindset was, because I'm just, it's not making sense. If the logic was, we want to invite presidential candidates and we want to give them both an opportunity to speak to the membership. Why would you substitute a virtual with a presidential candidate for an in person with a surrogate, as if the surrogate is on equal footing with a former U.S. president that's running for re-election? Make it make the fuck sense. It doesn't. It doesn't. Because it was never about objectivity or fairness or balance. Because if it was, both of them would have been speaking to the membership, whether in person or virtually, this week. So we can stop acting like this was about journalism. We can stop acting like this was an objective move. We can stop acting like it's our jobs as journalists. Well, what the fuck is your job as an actual media advocacy organization? Because it wasn't to be a newsroom. It was to actually defend, protect, and advocate for black journalists. How was this doing that? So, several people stepped out. Karen Atia from the Washington Post, who I consider a great colleague and friend in this industry, in this business. Um, she resigned as the co-chair of this convention and shared to the public on Twitter that she was not aware that Trump was coming and found out when the world found out. And she's the co-chair of this convention. Honorary or not, she's a face that's been promoting this convention and she was hoodwinked and bamboozled. Um, other folks have dropped out. Um, Raquel um, Willis, who you all know, who I know, she's an incredible trans writer. You know, we did a book talk um, in Philadelphia for the, Willis, the, the Risk It Takes to Bloom, an incredible black trans journalist. 
and a good friend of mine. She also has pulled out her book talk. Um, you know, she's supposed to be in the in the convention with Travel Anderson. They are a member of the NABJ board. They're going to be done with their term at the end of this year. And I can only imagine, I mean, at the end of this, this convention, and I can only imagine that their days within this organization might be uh, limited. I don't know that for a fact, but I can imagine knowing them that they're not going to be staying, sticking around for this shit show. Um, so far, they haven't said anything on social media. They're probably going to share their thoughts after the convention. I can only imagine that the stress and the, and the just frustration that they might be feeling right now. Because we used to work together on the LGBTQ task force for NABJ. And they ran for president against Ken Lemon uh, last year and lost. Um, and I can only imagine that this would have never happened under their presidency if they was the NABJ president. But, you know, this organization shows you who they are so many times. And I just wish people would finally believe them. Um, other folks, the, the CEO of Black Enterprise has 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 taken off a panel. Several panels have been rescheduled or canceled because people have been abruptly um disengaging and divesting from this convention. Um in spite of the fact that there was high registration cuz people some people definitely want to see the circus or be in the mix, but this is not a good look for NABJ. All the security, the protests outside of the hotel, the increased police, um the programming that got completely you know, just just in disarray behind this, the public backlash. And what did Trump do? Because we want to, you know, what did Trump do? Trump came, 35 minutes, and, you know, you know, you got Harrison Faulkner or Harris Faulkner from Fox News, who's buddy, buddy, cushion, cushion with Trump. And from what I've heard from sources, Trump would have not done the panel if that Fox News moderator was not there there were terms and agreements that trump had with nabj that we will, may not know all the details they will not probably be honest and tell us all the details but i can only imagine that there was a reason why harris faulkner who's not a very strong advocate for nabj not a big fan not not someone that we i don't even know if they're a member of nabj or how long they've been a member they they've they've probably done one previous event with nabj but they haven't been a major pillar there's been fox news people that have come to nabj um they typically do come in spite of the fact that they've won thumbs down awards by the organization again an advocacy organization gave them a thumbs down award so this whole argument about objectivity like come on advocacy organizations do not have to play it by the book in the ways in which they engage and represent and advocate for black journalists they can be actual factual and calling shit out so this whole event right was framed journalists are going to be able to ask the tough questions there were no journalists allowed to speak outside the moderators. There was no public questions. He spoke for 35 minutes. He didn't speak for an hour. He claimed that there was this delay, allegedly, um, that the mics and things weren't working and they were that NABJ was late. You know, basically trying to pull the whole CPT card. Apparently, NABJ claims that that wasn't the case, that there was some, apparently there was some ruffles from sources that said that he didn't want the fact checking to happen. So I don't even know if fact checking did happen. Um, but there was just a lot of other things behind the scenes. And but he claims that it was NABJ's fault. Trump might have lied on that. But again, when you bring a liar to a convention, what do you expect them to do? You know, send in the clowns. Um, Trump put out a statement before the convention announcing he was coming to NABJ, used his opportunity to spew more lies. And then got to the convention, before he got to the convention, put out another statement lying about Kamala Harris, lying about the vice president. Just more lies. Lies on top of lies. Stacking up of the lies. And NABJ did not dispel those lies before that man got on that damn stage. So he ran on Truth Social because he's not on Twitter. He put out statements. His team has put out all kinds of crazy things. And none of this stuff was corrected. So you have, you know... Journalists that were there, you know, Rachel Scott from ABC, he disparages her on the panel, says it's fake news, call ABC News fake news, call her nasty, insults her. And I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, like, just, just like these three black women, there was another reporter from another outlet, these three black women on this panel, you have two of them because 
you know, clearly Harris Faulkner has a relationship with um, Trump. But these other two black women on this panel, you, 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 you're, you're berating them. You're, you're, you're gaslighting them. You're dismissing them. You're doing everything you're going to do. And at some point, why did anyone stop it? Say enough. Why not? Why, why couldn't someone just say, you know what? No, we're going to have to cancel this invitation. No, they didn't do it. They wanted this attention. They wanted the moment. And so Trump, you know, got basically used the convention to test pilot a new attack on the vice president, which is that she turned black, that she, you know, she wasn't black before. She He didn't know her as a black woman, that he just knew her as being Indian, and now she turned black. And he's playing into a lot of this, this very anti-black racist rhetoric around questioning her identity her and ethnicity. And it's at the ire of the the damn Republican Party because they know that these racist attacks is falling right into a lot of the concerns that people have had for them for years. But a racist is going to do what a racist is going to do. And a party that backs the racist can't be surprised that a racist is going to be racist. And neither should a black organization platform a racist to be racist at their convention. Like, I just don't understand it. Trump does not support DEI. He's against diversity, equity, and inclusion. He's not an advocate for these issues. What did you think he was going to use your platform for? You're saying answer the tough questions. What questions did he really answer? Truthfully, what, what did he do? What did he say that was of any respect, rationale, logic, common sense, or consideration? Not a goddamn thing. Instead, he subjected a room of journalists that some were laughing, okay, because I watched it. There were people in the background laughing and there was a lot of shocks and gasps. But what the fuck did y'all think was going to happen? Like, it's almost like people are masochists. Like, people like the rage bait. Like, take me in a room for 35 minutes and glue me to a chair and let me hear a racist say racist things so I can go, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, it's 2024. You are sick. You are sick. You got to be sick because what's the point? Now, the crazy part is, is that some of the people in that room were not there to report. They were there with the, I got my popcorn ready. I'm going, I want to get a laugh. And there were people, sadly, that had to go there because their bosses made them go. Their bosses made them go to work at a journalism convention that was meant for them to relax, to network to be in a space where they didn't feel like they had to be working. The whole point of this convention was for them to learn, to grow, to stimulate. How are you at a convention where you're supposed to go to, to, to learn, to bring skills, to do panels, to educate, to mentor, to bond, and you're going to have to work? And I want to say this. NABJ is not a cheap convention. It is very expensive. Okay, the flights, the hotels, the suits, because, you know, we got to be dressed to impress the, the blouses, the heels, the nails, the hair. It costs a lot. The money for the parties, the dinners, the luncheons, you know, all of the things, the swag, you know, the money that is spent to go to this convention can cost over two thousand dollars easily. And imagine a time right now when a lot of black journalists, especially young people, because a lot of these people that go to this convention are very young. A lot of the journalists that go to the convention, I would say the majority of them are under the age of 35. A good number of them are under the age of 35. So you got young people out there, because I was one of those young people back in the day that spent hard on my, I saved money. You know, when I was first starting off in the game in 2016, when I was getting my feet wet, my first NABJ convention was in 2016 when Hillary Clinton came. And it was in D.C. And I literally, y'all, like, I was just getting my feet wet in the business. I was freelancing. I stayed, and, and if she listens to this, she knows. I was in Silver Spring, Maryland, staying at my homegirl, Farrah's place. And I love Farrah. That's a real one. My friend Farrah was living in Silver Spring, Maryland. We went to school. We went to college together. I've talked about it a couple of times on my podcast. But Farrah lived in Silver Spring. I, at the last minute, got, got some money to get registration and to be able to get there. I took a mega bus to DC from Philly. And I stayed in her um in her place that was a little far, but not too far from the hotel. Y'all, I spent maybe $60 a day to Uber back and forth 
to get from her place there because that was the cheapest thing I could do to hustle to be able to go to that convention. And if it would have been in LA or something, I would have not been able to go at that time. My rent was $450 a month. I was in a studio apartment. I was literally hustling to get to that position to go. And so I know the struggle for young people, right? To spend that money. There are some young black journalists that's in a hotel room, about four, four, four or five of them sharing a bed, two beds, twin beds and sleep on the floor to get in that convention so they can get a job because this is the one time they can go to a place where they might get someone to look at their resume. You just don't understand how important that convention has meant to so many people. And so for NABJ to betray those members and to create chaos for them and to waste their time and to waste some of their money is disgusting. This organization is in its flop era. And people have called for resignations. People have called for resignations. There's no other choice. You already know. I, I felt Ken Lemon should have been resigned in my book for several reasons. What a horrible presidency. That board, that leadership, the silence of that board. There's a woman who was a part of this political task force. Her name is Tia. And a lot of people have been criticizing her for how she's been responding on Twitter. And a lot of a lot of the way in which she's engaged folks on Twitter was just not the best. But what a damn shame that in this situation, black women have taken L's or has been targeted in a certain way. And this organization has thrown these black women under the bus. The only ones getting on Twitter trying to defend and support. Jamel Hill has done so much backpedaling. Now she's on the right side of the issue. But she came out and I was looking at her tweets and I, and I like Jamel a lot. Okay, let me be clear. She's I like her. I know her. She's a good person. But when she was on Twitter, I was initially trying to give the play devil's advocate, try to do the spin. I was like, no, no, Jamel, no, no, that's not, no, no, no. And eventually, after a couple of people just started, you know, speaking, she started to get it. And as more details began to emerge, she changed her position on it. But they should have never invited him because at the end of the day, it's a membership organization. You don't have to weaponize journalism ethics to justify fuck shit. They didn't care. This could have been avoided. They wanted their moment. And the question remains, was the juice as good as, was the juice, was the juice was worth the squeeze? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. And the truth of the matter is, more will come out. You know, more will come out. A dark cloud is over this convention. And it is what it is. What am I going to do? <laughs> I'm going to stay black, stay queer, stay winning. I just love that I'm not there. Rejection is protection. Did not dodge a bullet. Because I don't know. If I would have been there with all that, I don't know. They would have probably banned me for that. Because y'all know I wasn't going to shut up. Shout out to April Ryan, though, speaking out. She really been speaking out. Shout out to, to you know, Karan Phillips. He a little troll, but he's speaking out. Shout out to the folks that are fearlessly saying something. Shout out to, to Ra Ra Raquel. Shout out to the folks taking a stand and saying this is not okay. David Dennis, Michael Harriet, we see you, we hear you. Like shout out to the folks that saying this is just not okay. It's so many people. And it's time for others to do the same. If this executive director of NABJ stays in leadership, Drew Barry, if these people stay in power, expect more bullshit that's my opinion my opinion that's my opinion it's my opinion 
I'm entitled to it. It's free speech. Because it, it seems like NABJ, you know, picks and chooses when they want to amplify free speech or suppress it. It's funny that Trump gets welcomed back, but I get banned. But you know, you know, it is what it is. And to answer your questions, I'm about 99% certain I'm not coming back to NABJ. Um, don't want to at this point. It's in its flop era. And it, it just, it, the value ever since my band is diminished. It's it's completely diminished. The value of NABJ is diminished. It's lost its value. But I mean, that's what happens when you ban a black a black queer voice. When you when you suppress people's ability to speak out. And so I want to wrap this up in a way that puts a bow on this. What I've learned, and I hope this is a lesson, a teachable moment for people, is that the things that people will try to shame you about, you can take back your power, you can redefine it, you can embrace it in a way that proves the point. A lot of our heroes, a lot of 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 of, of important people were vilified before they were celebrated. And I think about that a lot when I make unpopular decisions. I call them unpopular right decisions that I think in history, I think of Nelson Mandela. I think of, of course, another great alpha man, Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think of so many people, Dalton Trombone, Paul Robeson, another great alpha man. I think of so many people, even Michael Lewinsky, that to a certain extent will be shamed and vilified written off in a certain way, called terrorists, called disinformation givers, accused of being a communist, you know, all of the things. And then as history progresses or time, the conversation changes. Revelations show. And the very people that you thought were wrong, you realize how clear as day they were right. And I'm just so fortunate and blessed to be able to be healthy, alive, well, strong, confident, and be able to, to, to have folks in, in rapid time come back and correct the record. That's what justice looks like. And I'm grateful for it. So... That's what I got for now. <laughs> um, I just hope people continue to be safe. You know, for those who are listening in Chicago to this special edition episode, some of y'all know who y'all are. I want to shout y'all out, but you know, feds be listening. <laughs> NABJ feds, not the feds. Hopefully not. Um, but I want y'all to be safe. And it's crazy because normally you don't tell people, you know, if you go to the RNC convention or you go to some rally, you tell people to be safe. Whoever thought that we would be telling black journalists at a black journalism convention to be safe? Raise hell. Raise hell, people. Raise, let me be clear, civil, nonviolent hell. But raise hell. Call for resignations. Go to the business meeting and let them have it. In a civil, nonviolent way. Let me be very clear. Because I don't want nobody trying to twist my words. We, we don't have to throw hands. We throw words. I haven't thrown no hands. I just throw words. I throw tweets. I throw words. My words hurt. They hurt enough. You don't want these hands. Nobody wants to smoke. But you know what I'm saying? But but clearly my words are strong and they're powerful. And that's the power of black journalism. I, I think about people like Ida B. Wells. I think of Chuck Stone. I think about the legends, right? Mary Mason, who just passed away recently. These are people who who stood up on and stood on business. They, they didn't allow people to walk into their house or to their space and just disrespect them. They stood up for each other. This is what the, 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 the these are the, 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 the giants that I, that, that I, that I, that I think of. These are the people that I think about. And if we don't, if we're not using these platforms to, to, to speak truth to power and, and take bold stances and to stop normalizing fuck shit then we're just doomed to fail. We just are. So I just want people to think about this moment in history 
and ask yourself what side of history, what side of history do you want to be on? Because I just look at my life and I'm like, wow, when I get to that point where I want to write a memoir, man, that chapter going to be good. Man, this chapter, I, I just think about where I'm going to be in history and where we want to be in history. Because we're in a very, I know this word gets used a lot, but this is a very unprecedented time. And history is going to look back at certain moments. And what what side do you want to be? Are you going to be the person that just just this was just cruising on your career, never stood on nothing, never never called something out, never just 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 lived in a la la land and you know the world was on fire and you was just doing your cute little job, getting little awards and acting like everything was okay. Is that who you want to be? That ain't fun. That's boring. Stand for something. Have faith. Look at what happened to me. And use it for, for an example of what resilience looks like. I'm living my best life. I'm doing things I never thought I was going to do. I got banned from an organization last year. And now I became a life member of a, of a fraternity. A black fraternity that I'm going to be a member of for life. I'm a life member of Alpha Phi Fraternity Incorporated. You know, the first. But like, I just think about just the timeline of what has happened in the past year. I was at a very low point in the spring of 2023. My book came out. I was doing a book tour. I was feeling good about that. One part of my career was great. And then a community of people that I've known for so long backstabbed me in a very dirty way. And I, I, did, not, and that, and I didn't know what that was going to look like, what my role was going to look like. And here I am a year from now feeling more fucking vindicated than I've ever felt this entire time. And so... I'm telling people there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's a rainbow literally out there with a pot of gold and some bags and some rubies. There's there's people in your wildest dreams. Stand for something. Literally stand for something because being complicit is a choice. It is. Being a coward is a choice. So just be different. Think different. Just do it differently. And that's all I got. So as always, be well and be best. Earnestly Speaking is recorded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. To stay up to date with the latest on the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mr. Ernest Owens. Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com.